This is Andy Alspa from Duke University School of Medicine. And in this presentation, we will explore a potentially deadly invasive fungal infection known as mucormycosis. The fungal kingdom is composed of a vast array of species that occupy most biological niches throughout the world. Now, fungi and humans therefore live in close proximity to each other. Every day, you're able to effectively clear fungal elements that you encounter in the environment. And fungi typically only grow on dead and decaying organic matter. Therefore, most fungi are unable to cause human disease, and fungal infections typically only occur in patients with specific risk factors. Now, this is why we see only a handful of fungi causing human disease, as demonstrated in this diagram. Human fungal infections are relatively rare in the general population, especially compared to bacterial and viral infections. However, as demonstrated on this slide, there are some fungi that can cause human infections, and there are a few fungal infections that are so potentially devastating and rapidly lethal that many healthcare providers must be able to recognize and diagnose and treat these conditions. One of these infections is mucormycosis, or invasive disease to the mucoralis group of fungi. In our pathogen map, these fungi are located in the fungal group and specifically in the mold subcategory. They're represented by two fungal names, mucor and rhizopus. The learning objectives for this presentation are to recognize patients that are at particularly high risk for the development of this lethal infection, mucormycosis. Then we will learn about the tools that we have to diagnose this infection and also to think through the interventions that we uh, have to be able to manage patients once the diagnosis is made. Lastly, we will, we will want to consider why clinicians from many different subspecialties must be able to recognize uh, this potential serious infection. Since this presentation is primarily intended for healthcare providers and students, I'm going to use it patient cases to discuss the basic principles of mucormycosis. So the first patient is a 62-year-old man with insulin requiring diabetes mellitus. He has never managed his diabetes with great care and his blood glucose levels are often very high. Over the past several years, he's developed serious complications of persistently high glucose levels and inadequate insulin administration, including a condition known as diabetic ketoacidosis or DKA. Now, in DKA, patients develop a metabolic acidosis characterized by hyperglycemia and excessive serum ketones, often requiring hospitalization for clinical treatment. Well, this patient came to the emergency room with yet another bout of DKA, but he also reported facial pain for the preceding several days. He was not thinking clearly, and the left side of his face was quite swollen and tender, particularly over his left maxillary sinus region. The combination of DKA and sinus inflammation prompted the emergency room physicians to be concerned about mucormycosis involving the nasal sinuses. Visual and endoscopic inspection confirmed the presence of inflamed material in this right maxillary sinus region, and a CT scan also indicated an inflammatory and destructive process in this region. The patient was taken immediately to the operating room for surgical removal of infected tissue. Microscopic examination of the surgical specimens revealed the presence of broad fungal hyphae, as demonstrated here in a fluorescent calcifer white stain of the surgical material. Typically, the hyphae of most molds have a uniform diameter and regular cross structures known as septa separating each fungal cell. However, the fungal elements in this specimen had varying diameters of the filaments and few septa along the hyphal length. This fungal morphology was consistent with the mucoralis group of fungi. Unfortunately, the patient's infection had progressed to involve the portions of the cranium adjacent to the base of the brain. Despite aggressive surgical debridement and high-dose antifungal therapy, the infection progressed and the patient died. As mentioned before, this infection called mucormycosis is caused by environmental molds that are ubiquitous in nature. In the scientific and medical literature, these fungi are called zygomycetes or the mucoralis fungi, so you must be familiar with both names 
although they basically refer to the same group of species. Some of the more common genus and species names among the mucoralis that cause human disease are rhizopus, mucor, rhizomucor, and cunninghamella. Now, these fungi are readily identified in the clinical microbiology lab by several fungal features. They are very rapidly growing. In fact, these are the molds that you might commonly find on old bread in your kitchen. In the microlab, they are frequently referred to as lid lifters, since their rapid hyphal growth can literally lift the lid off of a petri dish of growth medium. The mucoralis are readily distinguishable from other fungal mold pathogens by certain hyphal features. As demonstrated here in the insert, we see aspergillus with its regular septa or cross striations that separate one cell from the other. In contrast, in the larger image, we have a mucoralis fungus that has these very broad hyphae with no clear septa separating one cell from the other. Therefore, the hyphae of the mucoralis tend to fold in a ribbon-like fashion. These fungal features are very important since they provide the pathologist or the microbiologist with an immediate clue that they are looking at a muc mucoralis fungus rather than other molds such as aspergillus. The clinical approach and treatment is often very different for patients infected with these different type of fungi. So who's at risk for infections due to these common environmental molds? And why did this diabetic patient with no other immunocompromising features develop this life-threatening infection? Clinicians have long noted that mucormycosis tends to occur in patients with profound deficiencies in immunity, especially those with prolonged defects in neutrophil function, such as patients receiving high-dose chemotherapy for various cancers or hematopoietic stem cell transplantations. This is similar to the risk factors for infections due to other molds, such as aspergillus species. However, mucormycosis also occurs in diabetic patients with frequent episodes of DKA, as well as in patients with iron overload syndromes, such as hemochromatosis. In these syndromes, there is an excess deposition of iron in the tissues. Now, recently, investigators have discovered that iron availability is an essential component to the pathogenesis of mucormycosis and other infectious diseases. Typically, the host tries to sequester iron away from invading microorganisms using high-affinity iron-binding proteins. This system offers a nonspecific barrier, preventing many microorganisms from being able to grow in the effectively iron-starved environment of the host. However, Iron is more available to the microbes in the context of the acidic state of DKA or in metabolic conditions resulting in high tissue iron levels. The mucoralis fungi are particularly able to take advantage of these conditions to scavenge for iron and therefore to grow in the host. Since the mucoralis are present in the environment, it stands to reason that the most common sites of clinical presentation of mucormycosis or those sites in contact with the outside world. Rhinocerebral mucormycosis involves the nasal passages, sinuses, and potentially progressing to greater involvement of the head and neck, as we saw in the first patient case. This other patient also has rhinocerebral mucormycosis, and he developed a very late manifestation of this infection, or palatal escar, a necrotic region in his hard palate, Although this is very characteristic of rhinocerebral mucormycosis, it's a late finding and uh, should not be waited for in order to make the diagnosis. Pulmonary mucormycosis is the second most common type of this disease, often presented as a, presenting as a chronic pneumonia in immunocompromised patients. However, this infection can progress rapidly in neutropenic patients, and it must be considered early in the evaluation of lung infections in these patients. This chest CT scan demonstrates the degree of lung destruction that can result from pulmonary mucormycosis. In neutropenic patients, it can be clinically indis indistinguishable from other types of pneumonia, especially other fungal pneumonia such as aspergillosis. So an aggressive diagno diagnostic approach is important in these patients. An, em an emerging form of this infection is gastrointestinal mucormycosis presumably acquired after ingesting food or other material contaminated with this group of fungi. This patient demonstrated in the CT scan 
developed an intestinal perfor perforation after stem cell transplantation. There was fluid and air present outside of the lumen of the intestines. At surgery, the resected small bowel was noted to contain extensive fungal elements consistent with a mucoralis infection. <laughs> Mucormycosis can also develop into a disseminated syndrome that is almost always fatal. There's a common clinical observation about mucormycosis that raises an important question about its pathogenesis. This observation is that these infections are often centered around blood vessels. Now, as we discussed earlier, we know that mucormycosis typically begins at mucosal and epithelial surfaces, such as when mucor spores are inhaled into the lungs and reach the alveoli. The question is whether there's a specific tropism or growth attraction for the fungal elements toward blood vessels, as suggested in this diagram. Do these fungal elements sp possess specific binding affinities or other mechanisms to identify and invade vascular structures? Or alternatively, are vessels merely a path of least resistance in the tissue for hypogrowth? Now, why might this be important? Clinically, many of the manifestations of mucormycosis relate to vascular invasion. We often see necrotic tissue in the lungs of patients with pulmonary mucormycosis. Additionally, there's poorly viable tissue in the sinuses and other involved structures in rhinocerebral disease. Now, oftentimes, these poorly viable tissues must be surgically removed because they display decreased antibiotic penetration and decreased penetration of the immune cells. Decreased blood flow results not only in frank infarction and death of tissue, but also local tissue hypoxia in the surrounding regions. So the importance of hypoxia in the pathogenesis of infections is an area of acute investigation. Lastly, might we be able to interfere with this type of tissue targeting of blood vessels if it is truly occurring? This represents a novel preventive or therapeutic strategy for treating mucormycosis. The diagnosis of mucormycosis can be very difficult. Again, it is generally only considered in patients with neutrophil dysfunction or in the specific patient populations mentioned earlier, such as those with DKA. Although one would think that bread molds would be easy to recover in fungal culture of infected tissue, these fungi are notoriously difficult to grow in the microlab from clinical samples. Also, one can imagine that many non-sterile tissues might be contaminated by environmental molds, such as the mucoralis, making it very difficult to interpret cultures growing these molds. Therefore, histopathology of infected tissue is often required for the diagnosis. And the image here shows the broad aseptate hyphae of a mucor species invading tissue in gastrointestinal mucormycosis. Given the rapidly progressive and often fatal nature of these infections, Physicians caring for patients at risk for mucormycosis must maintain a high index of suspicion for this devastating infection and often begin empiric therapy even before the diagnosis is definitively made. Now, the most important aspect of the therapy of mucormycosis is surgical removal of infected tissue, especially that which is poorly viable. Each of the three patients presented here and discussed during this presentation underwent surgical removal of infected tissue. Facial and sinus debridement, extensive remo removal of infected lung tissue, and the resection of the involved region of the small bowel. Now, most antifungal agents are not effective against the mucoralis, but antifungal therapy does have a role in treating mucormycosis. These patients are often treated with very high doses of amphotericin based products, especially lipid or liposomal associated amphotericin B. This treatment places the patients at risk of renal toxicity, but this concern is often countered by the otherwise fatal nature of this untreated infection. The azole posaconazole has in vitro activity against some mucoralis isolates, but it has not been demonstrated to be sufficiently active to serve as primary therapy in the face of active infection. Newer treatment strategies are also being envisioned, including trying to alter the iron availability to these fungi. Now, these are treatments based on emerging basic research in this area. However, these strategies are only in early developmental stages.
Therefore, in summary, mucormycosis is a serious, life-threatening infection that must be recognized by many healthcare providers. Those that care for patients with diabetes, iron overload syndromes, cancers, or other immunocompromising conditions must be able to recognize patients at highest risk for this infection. Surgeons from many subspecialties will be asked to debride infected tissue involving facial structures, the lung, the GI tract, or even the brain. And clinical microbiologists and pathologists must be able to rapidly distinguish this fungus from other molds that cause human disease.